Welcome back, everyone, as we dive into part two of Old Britannia's video, The War Aims of Each Nation in World War I. I should mention that as I was browsing through his channel, it looks like he actually has a kind of a remake of this video where he goes into a much greater detail on the great powers, which is what we covered in the previous video. Uh, looks like it's about 40 minutes long, so that may be worth you checking out if you want to go deeper into the topic from the previous video about those great powers, because that was only about an 11-minute version, and he's got one that's almost three times that long, four times that long. Um, so that might be worth you checking out without my commentary since we're only covering the shorter ones. Uh, so today we're got diving into this next part of this, and it looks like in today's episode we're going to be covering Italy, the Ottoman Empire, the Serbians, Bulgarians, Romanians, and Greece. So uh, I'll put the link in the description not only to my uh, reaction to yesterday's video, uh, the previous part of this, uh, but also to the original content so you can check it out without my commentary. Let's go ahead and dive in. As the First World War raged between the five great powers of Europe, fighting for continental and potentially world supremacy, stuck in between these behemoths were several smaller nations, each pursuing their own more limited territorial goals in the conflict. Since its unification in the mid-19th century, Italy's statesmen had tried to present her as a great power in the concert of Europe. In reality, it was clear she was not. Why on earth should Italy demand an increase in territory? A Russian diplomat remarked to Bismarck in 1878. Has she lost another battle? Yeah. <laughs> so Italy's another relatively new country on the world stage at this point. Uh, Italy had been all kinds of various more independent states at different times. You had the Papal States and you had uh, like republics uh, in places like Florence. And um, I've actually just been learning a lot about the Medici family the last couple of weeks as I prepare for my trip to Italy next week because I'm going to be going to Florence uh, and seeing some of those places. So uh, yeah, like Germany, she's a relatively new country, but unlike Germany, she's not nearly the great military uh, an industrial behemoth that Germany is. So, uh, But they had joined, and I'm sure he's going to talk about this, they had been part of uh, this triple alliance with the uh, Austro-Hungarians and Germany, but that really didn't apply to World War I, to that scenario. Uh, and so what they really want is some of this territory that's owned by the Austro-Hungarians, and that's why they get into this whole thing. Yet, as the war got underway and Italy remained neutral, forsaking the Triple Alliance with Germany and Austria as a purely defensive arrangement, she suddenly became the most attractive potential ally in Europe. This left her in a position to extract territorial concessions right. from both the Entente and Central Powers. It's, what will you give me to join your side? What What's on the table? What do I have to be offered in this scenario? Germany attempted to maintain Italy's neutrality by bribing her with Austrian territory, including the Trentino region. This offer was far below Italy's expectations. Her political elite were generally made up of Anglophiles, whilst the country itself was dependent on British coal and other resources. Added to this were the territories the Entente were prepared to promise Italy, effectively everything Rome wanted from the Habsburg Empire, uniting the Italian minorities in these regions. The annexation of this land would also give her uncontested supremacy in the Adriatic. The so what's interesting about seeing some of this is that with the benefit of hindsight, we can look back at it and say, you know what, in the grand scheme of things, would have been a great deal for the Austro-Hungarians to say, you can have all of that territory. They obviously weren't going to do that so long as they thought they could win the war. But in hindsight, realizing that they're not only going to lose the war, but lose their empire, it would have been a small price to pay to turn Italy into an ally. And so instead of uh, having to deal with this just devastating front uh, in the Alps with places like Isonzo, where you have just like more than a dozen major battles happen, uh, you could have turned them on the French and opened up another front there and maybe completely changed the complexion of this war. The Entente further sweetened the pot with the promise of a protectorate over Albania, territory from the Ottoman Empire, and a large subsidy from Britain. All of this proved too much of a temptation for Italian statesmen to resist, leading them to enter the war, albeit to much popular opposition, on the 23rd of May 1915. It's kind of interesting how, 
in both of these wars, Italy is kind of I, I don't want to. I don't want to discount Italy as a power because they certainly bring a lot to the table. And, and obviously this is the cradle of Western civilization. I mean, you know, perhaps the greatest empire the world has ever known comes out of Italy. Um, but uh, they're, they're almost like a reluctant power in all of this, not only in this war, but in the second war as well. Italy was unfortunate that the Austrians their main opposition in the conflict, held one of the best defensive positions in Europe, the Isonzo River, yeah. and so she was unable to seize most of her claimed lands until late 1918. Britain and France were consequently sceptical as to whether the Italian contribution had been worth the bribes offered to induce her into the conflict, especially after the Caporetto debacle had forced the... And my argument would be what I just said a few minutes ago, which is it's less about what they can add to the war and more about keeping them from being an enemy. You'd rather they just were neutral, but if they're gonna join, you'd rather they're on your side than on the opposite side. ...them to redeploy troops from the Western Front just before the German Spring Offensives. One British diplomat was frankly contemptuous, saying, as for the Italians, what can you expect from a nation the majority of which would be better employed selling ice cream? It was an unfair assessment, but shows something of the Anglo-French thought process at the peace discussions. As such, Italy was denied the full territorial compensation it had originally been promised, mainly on the Wilsonian basis of national self-determination. The result was a nation that felt cheated, and was consequently to become a revisionist power in the post-war world. Of all the nations that entered the First World War willingly, the Ottoman Empire's decision must be the most bizarre. By 1914 the country was in a tenuous position, with most of its huge debt held by foreign powers. Yeah, and, and by this point the Ottoman Empire has been on the decline for, it's been like a really slow but steady decline for a couple of centuries now. Uh, and again, they're a, a multi kind of ethnic, multi national, even multi-religion, even just in terms of you have Christians and you have various kinds of Muslims and you have uh, Orthodox and other groups in there. Um, so it's it's very tenuously held together. They've had a couple of disasters uh, in the early part of the 20th century uh, with the events in the Balkan Wars. And yeah, it, it on the surface, you would look at that and think, why would you even get involved if you're the Ottoman Empire? More recently, she had continued her steady decline and lost further territories in both the Balkan and Italo-Turkish wars. A sensible plan in 1914 would then have been to remain neutral and extract concessions from both sides. For the most part, the Sublime Port agreed with this assessment, but a few high-ranking officials, led by the War Minister Enver Pasha, saw conflict as a preferable outcome. They feared that if Turkey did not pick a side, then she would be partitioned by whichever grouping was victorious. So this is really about let's control our own destiny sort of thing. And the Ottoman Empire is going to be another one that's going to see continued fighting after uh, the traditional World War I is over. Things are going to continue and, and you're going to see kind of the emergence of Turkey as a state. War would also provide an opportunity for the port to shed its immense debt burden and assert its independence from both the Entente and Central Powers, as well as avenging the seizure of two dreadnoughts by the British at the start of the war, paid for by popular subscription, though Britain had offered financial compensation. Territorial claims weren't actually Turkey's main concern, but it was hoped they may be able to force the Russians back from the Caucasus, and so set up buffer states, thus protecting them from future Russian expansionism. It was also believed the defeat of the Entente may lead the door open for the domination of Persia, and perhaps even the re-establishment of Ottoman authority over Egypt. Theoretically a Turkish client until 1914, but de facto under British rule. The Turks had also made clear that if Greece joined the war, they desired the Aegean Islands, and there was some talk of retaking Cyprus and Crete, never a realistic proposition. The capitulation of Russia in 1918 did allow the Turks to move into the Caucasus, though it's debatable as to whether they or the Germans would have dominated the region mm. had the Central Powers won. In the end, the Ottomans suffered the exact fate they joined the war to avoid. The Empire was partitioned by the Entente in the wake of their victory, though under the brilliant leadership of Mustafa Kemal, they would reverse the most devastating of the territorial concessions to found the modern nation of Turkey. 
Serbia's rejection of an Austrian ultimatum in 1914 that would have effectively turned them into a vassal of Vienna led to the start of the war. The Ser- yeah, and that's a fair assessment of it. Uh, there were these 10 demands that they made, and the way I always describe it is that Serbia accepted like nine and a half of them. Uh, the one they just would not relent on was the idea of allowing the Austro-Hungarians to basically control their criminal justice system uh, when it came to prosecuting the the people involved in the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. They were pretty much willing to give in to everything else, enough so that the German Kaiser, although he waits too long to say this, uh, basically said that what they were willing to give in on removed all pretext for war, but by that point it was too late. Serbs in 1914 were an immensely self-confident nation having recently won two Balkan Wars which almost doubled their territory. Naturally then, the war was seen as the long-awaited opportunity to seize the Slav-inhabited areas of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. When Italy entered the war in 1915, the Entente tried to reconcile both Rome and Belgrade's designs, which clashed over areas such as the Dalmatian coast. As such, Serbia was assigned these lands at the end of the war, The Serbs failed to take this territory themselves, instead being overrun by a joint Central Powers invasion in 1915, but their war effort continued from exile. And this is another example of how the world is different even in my lifetime. When I was younger, uh, Yugoslavia was a country, the South Slavs. Uh, And I was a teenager when all of that got broken up and you ended up with uh, Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina and Serbia and Montenegro and all of these nations that were born out of that. The Corfu Declaration in 1917 announced Serbia's intention to form a Yugoslav state and, with the disintegration of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the end of the war, Serbia was apportioned even more of the former Habsburg territories than it had been promised before even dethroning the King of Montenegro to create a Yugoslav state. Superficially, the war was then a major success, but the enormous devastation of Serbia, resulting in the deaths of perhaps 25% of its mobilized population. That's a great point. Serbia, probably more than any other uh, nation in Europe, uh, suffers as far as their male population, their their military age population is just death, like just annihilated is overstating it, but it had to have felt that way. Meant the victory was arguably the most bittersweet of any nation. Bulgaria played the part of a mercenary in the early stages yep, of the war. That's a good way to describe to see it. see which side could stump up the better territorial offer. The Entente, particularly Britain, were largely sympathetic to the Bulgarians and badgered Serbia into offering them territorial concessions, along with the land it had lost to Turkey in the Second Balkan War. And what's what's amazing about this is how well the Serbs actually hold on against the onslaught of the Austro-Hungarians, which was really the pretext of the war in the first place. It's only when Bulgaria comes in, and you can see why that would be the case. Serbia is holding on its northern border against the Austro-Hungarians, but then Bulgaria comes in, and now suddenly you've got this massive new front that you've got to deal with. But even though the Entente may have offered easy pickings, for the beleaguered Ottomans were unlikely to have survived a Bulgarian assault, they were nonetheless slim. The Central Powers, on the other hand, were prepared to offer the Bulgarians all of the parts of Serbia they wanted, along with a token strip from the Turks. In 1916, these aims expanded with the entry of Romania on the side of the Entente. The same happened in 1917 with the entry of Greece, which would have allowed Bulgaria to retake land lost in the Second Balkan War. It's just a crazy area of this war, and and it's it's obvious why uh, people like Otto von Bismarck at the end of the 19th century looks at the Balkans, this area here, and, and understands that this is what many call the powder keg of Europe, where something's gonna set it off and it's just gonna explode. Because you have everywhere else, you've got these major powers who have this balance of power thing going on. Well, that's not really happening down here. And so you've got all these smaller states that could go either way and could be kind of up for grabs and and have their own demands from each other. And it could be any one of those little things that sets off the whole thing. And that's what happens. And, And it continues to be triggering new things happening as the war progresses. There were also more far-fetched ideas about seizing an outlet on the Adriatic, but these were never concrete plans. 
Bulgarian aims looked something like this then, which, had she been able to hold them, would have ensured hegemony over the Balkans. As it was, the Bulgarian government's gamble came back to haunt them, their population starving, their army defeated, they were stripped of further land by the victorious Entente. Romania entered the war opportunistically in 1916. She had previously been within the Triple Alliance's sphere of influence, but had been edging towards the Entente's camp in the prelude to 1914. She joined the conflict when it seemed as if Austria-Hungary was on the verge of defeat. Her aims were focused on taking Transylvania and Bukovina. Promise and basically building the area that we know as modern Romania today. ...to her in the Treaty of Bucharest, which would largely unify Greater Romania. As it was, Romania joined too late to truly exploit Austrian weakness in the aftermath of the Brusilov Offensive. Instead, its largely outdated army was quickly routed. Nevertheless, the nation wasn't defeated. What remained of their forces reorganised with Russian aid and proved quite effective for the rest of the conflict. But they were left in an impossible position in early 1918, when Russia exited the war. Consequently, they signed a devastating separate peace with the Central Powers, though they were given Bessarabia from the collapsing Russian state in compensation. Ultimately though, the king refused to ratify the treaty, a gamble that was to pay off later that year. In late 1918, with Habsburg power collapsing, Romania re-entered the war, so as mm. to have a say in the post-war settlement. The Entente... You can see how, how complex this situation is, and we're only really just highlighting the major points of it. Every one of these nations has its own war aims, has its own goals, its own territory that it's after, and very often that conflicts with other people, not only on their side, but on the opposite side. And, and, and there's so many moving pieces to all of this, and this is why the Treaty of Versailles and that whole conference was so complex, because you were trying to deal with all these. You've got Japan on the other side of the world jumping in, and they want a seat at the table. Uh, it's, it's a nightmare. Keen to bring the hammer down on the Hungarians, apportioned Romania practically all of the land it hoped for. It's perhaps ironic that the only Entente power to actually be forced into making a separate peace was also the one to come out of the conflict with far more than it had first aimed for. The only nation in Europe that the outbreak of war was potentially good for was Greece. The nation was only weeks off entering into a third Balkan war with the Ottomans over the Aegean Islands. And with two dreadnoughts soon to be arriving at Constantinople, it was unlikely to be one the Greeks would win. Hmm. In theory then, it would have made perfect strategic sense for the Greeks to harness the Entente's overwhelming naval supremacy by entering the war and secure their safety by defeating Turkey. As it was, Greek politics was irrevocably divided over the war, a division for the sake of brevity I won't go into here. To oversimplify, much of the country wished to side with the Entente, reflected by the nation's brilliant Prime Minister Venizelos, who favoured a scheme proposed by the British that would have seen Greece give land to the Bulgarians, bringing them into the fold, in return for large concessions in Anatolia once the Ottomans were defeated. Yeah, uh, makes sense. Greece gives up a little bit of territory to keep their northern border secure, but in exchange gets some very valuable territory on what is now Turkey. Uh, it, it, it seems like a good trade-off on the surface. The king, however, with strong ties to Germany, refused to abandon neutrality. And this king, this is the same family that the, the British royal family uh, in part descends from uh, Prince Philip, uh, Queen Elizabeth II's husband, was a member of the Greek royal family. The national schism that followed paralyzed Greek foreign policy, and it was not until 1917 the nation tentatively entered the conflict. They were promised major territorial concessions to do so, though notably not Constantinople, a long-held Greek desire. In the end, Greece was apportioned most of what it wanted with the Treaty of Sevres, which, had Athens been able to hold the territory, would have fulfilled much of the Megali idea. But her attempts to impose Greek authority in Asia Minor were thwarted in the Greco-Turkish War. In almost all cases, the great powers tried to tempt these minor countries into the war with exaggerated promises of territory, that only later served to get in the way of a negotiated peace. Yeah, really, I mean, the great powers, let's be honest, they took advantage of these smaller powers as proxies to get what they wanted. Uh, and then, really, for what these some of these smaller countries uh, gave up in terms of their resources and manpower and casualties, things like that, uh, their return really 
didn't justify it in the end. The Austrian Emperor's tentative peace offers, for example, were rebuffed in 1917 by the Entente, on the basis the Italians would understandably not be willing to abandon their war aims after so much bloodshed. Most arguably overperformed militarily, but diplomatically, the cost to either the Entente or Central Powers was probably not worth it. All right, so you might be wondering, okay, where are countries like the United States? Well, the United States doesn't really come into the war with any real aims as far as territory and things like that. Woodrow Wilson is mainly concerned about how he can help shape the post-war world. Uh, the ideas of self-determination, the ideas of influence, the, the idea of a League of Nations, which is a precursor to the United Nations. Uh, those are the things that Wilson's really concerned about, is how the U.S. can help with their voice and their power shape the post-war world, not necessarily take anything from it. So it makes sense he doesn't really cover anything about that. There's really not much to talk about there. So uh, let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. I'd love especially to hear from some of the countries that are mentioned in that uh, video today. Folks who are in those countries, what do you think about it and how do you see things? Uh, I want to thank Stein in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Been to Nijmegen. Love it there. Great place. A lot of history. Uh, and also Robin in Ulmen in Germany, Deutschland. Thank you both for your continued support on Patreon. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.